So we've had a look at uh, one object that will play back sound from uh, a buffer, and uh, now we'll look at another one, which is called Groove Tilde. Um, so in exactly the same way as the Play Tilde object, uh, you put in the name of the object and then you add the name of the buffer that you want to refer to. So in this case it's my sound one. Um, and uh, again, you have a, a second argument which refers to the number of channels. Um, and as in the last tutorial, I've got the drop file object with a replace message, uh, which I'm going to use to load a sample of an indeterminate length, at least until I drop it in. So it'll be our drum loop again. Um, now the groove object works in a different way to play. Uh, while play requires an object to drive it, so that was the line object or the phaser, um, and those send values uh, which tell play which millisecond to play. And so, of course, if you count up the milliseconds, then you tell play to kind of read through the file. Uh, Groove doesn't work like that. Groove is much more like the SF play object insofar as uh, you specify a rate at which it reads back and tell it when to start and when to stop, um, and perhaps where in the file to read from. So um, it might be from zero milliseconds right at the beginning, or from two seconds or three seconds if you wanted it to start further into the file. So that's what we've got uh, down here. We've got, first of all, a message which tells the Groove object what rate to play at. And the sig tilde object basically spits out a number that's given as an argument or sent into its inlet constantly. So it's, in this case it's sending out the number 1 44,100 times a second because that's the sample rate uh, we're using. And that is telling Groove constantly what speed to play back the sound file at. So when I get it to play, then we'll hear it play back at normal speed because it's a number one in exactly the same way as the SF play uh, rate parameter. As I said before, you can specify a point at which it starts. So unlike SF play, it doesn't receive a message from the toggle object or a one to start or zero to stop. In this case, you're just sending it a message to tell it where to play from. So in this case, I'm telling it to play from millisecond zero, which having loaded the file, it should do. And so it plays all the way through to the end of the file and then stops. We can imagine actually that Groove is continuing to play something, uh, or in fact nothing, beyond the end of what we had in the buffer. Um, it's constantly being told to read, but uh, obviously we've run out of sound file. So we have similar functionality to the SF play object. Um, so I'll just move this along a little bit so I can fit stuff in. We have a means of looping. So I can say uh, loop, send a message loop, and then either one for start or zero for stop. So if I do that, it tells looping to switch on. So I'll do that. And uh, when I press zero now, we, when it gets to the end of the buffer, it'll loop back and play it again. Um, it might be that we don't. We want a means of turning looping off as well. So what I'm going to do is to use our friend the wildcard again and use a toggle to say uh, it's sending a loop one at the moment. A loop zero tells it to uh, turn looping off. And so when in this instance, when it gets to the end of the uh, buffer, it stops. But if we had looping on and uh, we wanted to stop the sound, then instead of a zero message, we send the message stop. So this is slightly perhaps counterintuitive if you're trying to compare it with the SF play object because it doesn't work in quite the same way. But otherwise uh, it's relatively similar. One thing which it has uh, obviously which the SF play object doesn't have is two inlets which are labeled loop min and loop max. So quite apart from being able to loop the entire sample, we can loop a fragment of it. And to do that, we would send messages to, to these inlets. 
And with looping switched on, specify some loop points. So we'll specify from 169 milliseconds to uh, 406 milliseconds, and then get the part file to play. What it'll do when I press zero is to play from the beginning of the file uh, to uh, through to the end of that loop point, and then loop back to the uh, start loop point that we specified here. So it's still starting from the beginning. In fact, maybe I should make these loop points a little bit later so that that's more obvious. So I will make it from 1443 to 1765, or maybe a bit longer. Okay, so it start at the beginning and then loop to those points. Um, we could actually get it to start at the beginning of the loop point and just play the loop, and we can do that by uh, sending the message start loop. So we do that. And it just starts there. So um, that's the, the, the Groove object in, uh, in BASIC. Um, and obviously if you wanted to find out a little bit more about it, you can um, alt-click on it or, or right-click and choose help. Uh, and that will bring up the help file, which confirms how that works and gives you various information about how it works. But we're going to do something uh, quite specific now, uh, just to just show you one of the things that Groove can do. And it's in the exercises here. I've basically followed through all of this stuff. And I'm going to add what it suggests we add here, which are two waveform objects. So uh, we can find a waveform up here in add object and audio, uh, which is here. Uh, but obviously I could just make the, uh, the object by writing in like that. So we have two waveform objects. And currently they're not referring to any particular waveform, but just as with the uh, groove tilde object and the play tilde object, you can tell them which buffer to refer to. Uh, obviously, there's nowhere I can write in an argument. Well, there is, actually. If I were to go into the inspector window, then I can write it into this buffer tilde object name bit. Um, so I could write that in as uh, my sound one if I wanted to. Uh, so actually, I'll do that for this one. My sound one. So I can click on there. And by default, it automatically reads channel one. Um, but if I another way of doing that would be to send a message and say set my sound one, and I can give it a second uh, argument here to say uh, to read channel two. If I send that to this waveform object, it'll read the second channel, which you can see is a little different. So what have I asked you to do here? Uh, well, I suggest that you connect them so that. Uh, what we have down here is two outlets which say selection start and selection end. So we will connect those up to these float objects. Um, and then because we want these two waveform objects to work in conjunction, there's a, an outlet on the end of each or the outlet and inlets on the end of each which allow you to connect them up. Now at the moment they're not doing very much. If I lock the patch and click on them, uh, nothing happens. But we can specify a mode in which they will operate. Um, and if you go to the next slide, it'll tell you how to do that. So I can send a message to each one uh, using our wildcard again and a number box. And if I choose mode number one, and hover over here, then you'll see that my cursor changes to a select cursor. If I choose number two, then it changes to a double arrowed cursor. Number three is a, a hand, and then number four is a crosshairs for drawing. Uh, we won't use that one yet. But if I go back to number one, this one will allow me to make a selection uh, which covers both of those waveforms. And you'll notice that when I do so, we get numbers down here, and you can imagine that those are specifying a loop section for my sound. Which you can have some fun with immediately. Um, 
<coughs> so select mode allows you to make that selection. If we choose the next mode, which is loop mode, then that allows us to change the length of that loop or loop grain. So on. Um, and dr uh, move mode, which is number three, allows you to move the, uh, just kind of zoom in on the, the waveform. We don't really need to do that. So you could hear that I was creating a looped grain there and then moving it around manually uh, with the cursor. But what happens if you wanted to provide a kind of I don't know, granulation effect maybe, or a granular time stretch, as I've proposed here? So we'll do that. Um, I've said, using a line and a plus object, effect a granular time stretch over your sound file. So first thing, you need to use a line object. So here we're using a line non-tilde object. So this is a line object that's working in uh, control domain rather than signal. But broadly it works in the same way. It's just that you can't use multiple lines within a single message. Uh, there is a way of doing that, but we won't worry about that right now. So I'm going to connect this to my selection start point. Uh, so I will say we want this to read from, say, uh, the beginning of the sound file to the end of the sound file. And I am going to, I, I, I remember broadly that the end of the sound file is approximately uh, 3,500 milliseconds. And I'm going to do that at over a, a period of 10 seconds. So it's going to take longer to read through than the length of the file. And I'm going to connect that to line. Now, if I, if I click that now, what happens? Well, it starts reading through. And because it catches up with the end loop point, and it kind of drags it along with it. But you saw that it wasn't moving the end loop point um, until such time as it caught up with it. So what we can do is to specify an offset from our start point and we'll do that using the plus object and I'm going to I'm going to work in integer mode it doesn't really matter too much I think for the purposes of what we're doing um, so if I send the, the output of line which is sending the uh, changing number as it walks through the file uh, to there I can then connect that to the selection end point and give it a constant rate which I will do. Uh, so we'll say we want our grain to be 100 milliseconds in length. So I'll lock the patch and you will see when I click this that we now have a, a selection which is a consistent length and it walks through the file over that 10 seconds. And of course if I then send um, a, a number box to this plus object then we can change the size of that grain either over the course of the, the walk or just kind of leave it as it is. So let's have a listen to that. And so we have a, a granular time stretch. Um, we've slowed down the rate of the sound file, but it's not changed its pitch. So that provides you with an introduction to the groove object. We could use it just as we used the SF play object earlier to simply play through a sound file. Um, or to loop it as we've seen, uh, but you can also do some other things related to granulation um, and we'll probably look at granulation in more detail uh, in due course.